Throughout their history, the Lakers have had a long line of dominating centers. Will Chamberlain stood tall for the 1972 championship team. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was at the center of the Showtime dynasty. And today, it's Shaquille O'Neal who rules the middle in L.A. But the tradition began when the Lakers were in Minneapolis. And their big man was George Mikan, a player who was the pioneer of modern-day basketball. This week, it's Mr. Basketball, George Mikan, on Vintage NBA. Basketball has changed. It's always been a great game, but now it has a new spirit. He dunks like Dr. J. He might be the new Iceman. The modern day, Will Chamberlain. He looked like Magic Johnson. The future has arrived. You are watching what your greatness is all about. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Vintage NBA. I'm Robin Roberts. Now today the NBA is a league filled with marquee names like Shaq and Kobe, Iverson and Carter. But one man paved the way for all of them. This week we look at the NBA's original superstar, George Mikan. Now, during the league's early years, he dominated the game and made the Minneapolis Lakers the NBA's first dynasty. Minnesota may have lost the Lakers, but it now has the Timberwolves and a new marquee player, Kevin Garnett. This week Kevin is in the chair with his vintage Laker jersey reflecting on the career of George Mikan. I don't think anybody can say enough great things about George Mikan and all he's done for the game. And look at the face, y'all. Look at this face right here. You gotta get this face. Look at that. See, look, that's back when intense was intense. You see that? Oh. The Associated Press, in its nationwide poll a year ago, named George America's greatest basketball player of this first half century. Hey, boy, Basketball player of the half century. Oh, that's why I'm all wheezy in this jersey, man. I'm not the one transcending the game like George Mikan did. It's kind of weird, you know? At least let's get his permission. So anybody got a phone around here? There are, after all, many big men in basketball, but there is only one George Mikan. It's not only his size, but his extraordinary skill as well that makes him the biggest star in the game. How do these look, man? He wore these playing in the game. No strap, no nothing. Man, imagine if somebody's like to hit you across the face with this, though, you know? So what, after the game, he would give his glasses away or something? He look kind of hot. Uh, you spotted too many shots, Mr. Michael. We're gonna have to uh, change these rules now. Okay, you spot it like that again, it's a go ten. That's that's pretty deep. They don't they don't maneuver too many rules. <laughs> to wind the lane and put a goaltender on. I'm surprised they didn't raise the basket and put a lid over to where you gotta jump, open the lid and throw it in there like as if it was a crop pot or something. The Lakers pull away and go on to win 77 to 69 and take the series from Syracuse 4 to 2 to become world champions for the third straight year. I'm totally dedicated towards that, that goal right there. Again, three in a row so this city can uh, resurrect itself from the George Mikan days. Garnett receives, turns to the foul line, it's in the air! Oh, the big ticket has just knocked down the big shot, and Kevin Garnett has just delivered a big punch that has knocked out the Detroit Pistons as the final buzzer is. I think I met him twice, right before games. He likes what I do, he loves my enthusiasm, and that feels good coming from someone who totally set the tone for guys like myself. Because I am a big man, um, I know, I know my history, I know sort of the footsteps that I've stepped in on my way to this vast journey. He was 6'11", seven, seven foot, size of a bear, and he, he showed a whole different side of the game, that you know what, being powerful, being big, there was nothing wrong with that. Actually, be proud that you're this size, and it's an advantage, and I'm going to show you how to use it. And under the basket goes that hook pass to the big fellow, and in she goes, and the game is a close one once more. He set the tone in which the game is to be played now. You know, without George Mikan, if you take him out of the equation, we don't have a hook shot. Kareem doesn't have 38,000 points off a hook shot. You don't have Wilt hitting 100 points, showing that he can be dominant. 
Now you don't have that footprint to go by. The game has not been transcended yet. You know, it's not only current players like Garnett who recognize Mikan's contributions. When the 50 greatest players were honored in 1997, Bill Russell went up to George and said, you were my hero. I studied everything you did. Standing next to Russell, Wilt Chamberlain, who said, put me in that category too. Wilt said Mikan showed the world that a big man could also be a graceful athlete. We'll have much more on the career of George Mikan when we come back. Meet the Mikans. George and wife Pat with sons Larry, Terry, and baby Patrick who have a lovely home in Minneapolis. Mikan was very important towards the beginnings of the game to popularize it because they were able to popularize him as a superstar. Home sweet home, typical Americana and typical Americans, far from the glare of the public spotlight, close to the fair of the private highlight. Making his mark for Mike in is a family affair, a good sport to whom sport has been good, a grandfather, and someday he'll be a grandfather. He always was a guy that went for two swell points, a hot shot, big shot, Mr. Basketball. Before the NBA was even established, George Mikan was already making a name for himself in basketball. The two-time College Player of the Year, he led DePaul to the 1945 national title. Mikan joined a pro team called the Chicago American Gears. Then it was on to the Minneapolis Lakers, where he became a superstar. And in many ways, it was Mikan who defined the game as we know it today. George Mr. Basketball Mikan, the Lakers' big center, was voted the top basketball player of the 20th century in an Associated Press poll. Mikan, who led the pro league in scoring for four straight years, holds every scoring record in the book. It was a period that, in my mind, sticks as, as Mikan dominating everything. George and the Lakers were, any time you beat them, it was something special. Beginning in 1949, George Mikan led his Lakers to five titles in six years. He towered over the NBA as a league's original icon. George Mikan, the Joe DiMaggio of basketball, stands 6'10 and aces high with his National Basketball Association teammates, the Minneapolis Lakers, perhaps the greatest professional team in history. When I played with my teammates, we would pack the arenas. No matter where we played, we'd have a full house. And so, uh, we had a great impact, at least I did, on the league, and uh, I hate to say that, but uh, it happens to be true. <laughs> he was uh, the big attraction uh, in the National Basketball Association for the first four or five years he played in the league. Meet the Mikans, George and wife Pat, with sons Larry, Terry, and baby Patrick, who have a lovely home in Minneapolis. Mikan was very important towards the beginnings of the game to popularize it because they were able to popularize him as a superstar. One night we were walking toward the garden to get ready to play against the Knicks. And I looked up at the marquee and there it says on the marquee, George Mikan versus the Knicks. And I said, oh boy, they shouldn't have done that. So anyhow, we got into the locker room and uh, the guys were really giving it to me. And, there was no one dressing. And I said, all right, what's going on? And they started saying, well, you got the publicity. You're on the marquee. Go out there and play them. And so they really razzed me for quite a bit. And finally, they uh, decided to come along. Minneapolis versus New York. The Lakers against the Knickerbockers. KG Quintets, where the difference is spelled M-I-K-A-N. And Mikan lived up to his billing. Opponents had no way to stop him, as he combined unprecedented size with a nimble assortment of low post moves. He dominated basketball in his era, as Shaq O'Neal does in this era. He was bigger than most everybody else. He had a wide body. Uh, he loved to play, and he was a scorer, a very prolific scorer. Michael was a giant among men. No other man in basketball is as devastating as Mikan when it comes to playing the pivot position. Averaging nearly 24 points per game during the season, this all-time all-star has extraordinary scoring punch. When I got out of college and I had to play against Minneapolis, I studied Mikan. And he always went to one spot. And he always shot with his right hand. 
and he, and he rebounded well. So I said, I'm going to get to the spot ahead of him. I'm going to overplay him on the right side. I'll box him out. I did those things when we played him, and I held him to 42 points. It's another one of those George Mikan nights. And the big fella just going on and on. Yes, Mikan, and more Mikan is the story of this game. George was a rough individual underneath the basket. He could care less about anybody else except winning for the league. I was a pussy cat out there. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't hurt anybody. As a result of Mikan's dominance in the paint, the NBA widened the three-second lane from six to 12 feet. The low post at those days was low because the three-second lane was only six feet wide. That means that Mikan stationed himself three feet from the basket. And uh, to play it behind him was, was, was death. I mean, you couldn't stop him. George is at his best in the pivot. His ability to get position on the defensive man makes his hook shot a sure score. But it wasn't only Mikan's offense that transformed the game. The league also instituted the goaltending rule to keep him from swatting away every opposing shot at the basket. Yeah, the goaltending rule came in because I used to goaltend, go up and stop the ball from going in the hoop. I could jump high enough to stop it, whether it be offense or defense. You talk about a frustrating situation. Well, that was it. Every time you shot the ball, he just knocked it away. But the rules changes did little to diminish Mikan's effectiveness. He made the Lakers the powerhouse of the league, and he had plenty of help, as Minneapolis surrounded him with a collection of talented players. Mayor Jim Pollard, who I know could have played today, uh, Vern Mickelson, Slater Martin. Uh, so they had, a, they had a great team. With Mike and Mick and Paul and Blue and Kunlo running a team. The team's terrific, the beast, the Civic is basketball supreme. There's something about that Lakers score that makes the fans want more. It was sort of nice to take the basketball court and have the announcers say, the Minneapolis Lakers, the world champion. And that's quite an accolade, and we try to live up to it. Along with the other rules changes, Mikan also had a lot to do with the invention of the 24-second clock. During one game in 1950, the Pistons decided the only way they could beat the Lakers was to hold on to the ball and not let George have it. They did end up winning by a final score of 19-18. to 18. And that game was pointed to as evidence of the need for a shot clock. Coming up, a tale of two dynasties. Mike and the Lakers meet the New York Yankees. But first, a look back to their fourth championship season, 1952. off the web. Welcome back everyone. I've just been scanning through George Mikan's bio on the web, reading about his accomplishments, and it mentions that his Minneapolis Lakers won five NBA titles from 1949 to 54. It's almost a direct parallel to another dynasty, the New York Yankees. They won five straight championships from 49 to 53. One year the teams had a chance to compare notes when Mikan and the Lakers were invited to the house that Ruth built. New York is a great town, recognizing greatness in others. It took the Minneapolis Lakers to its heart, just as it has taken its own champions. Sometimes the Lakers were knee deep in the admiration of their fans, but perhaps the finest recognition the Lakers received was that given them by the New York Yankees. Manager Casey Stengel, Yogi Berra, Vic Rashi, Phil Rizzuto, to mention just a few, extended congratulations from the Kings of Baseball to the Minneapolis Kings of Basketball. They used uh, my notoriety to uh, develop fan appeal. And one of the reasons why I gave a lot of autographs at that time was when I was a kid, around 12 years old, I was the marble champion of Will County in Joliet, Illinois. And our reward was to go to a uh, White Sox-Yankee game in Chicago. And of course, who was playing there but the babe, Babe Ruth. And when the game was over, uh, they took me down to meet him and he signed the baseball for me. 
One of the things I admired about him was that uh, he never turned a youngster down. He'd stay there until they were all satisfied. And I made up my mind then, he being my idol, that if I ever had the chance, I'd do the same thing. Mr. Basketball, the Babe Ruth of basketball. <laughs> Couldn't hit a curve. All right, so he couldn't hit a curve, but he could hit a hook shot. And like the Babe, Mike can almost single-handedly put his sport on the map. George wasn't just a star, he was also a promoter. When the Lakers played on the road, he'd arrive in town a day early to do appearances and interviews promoting that game. And at a time when the NBA wasn't receiving much publicity, George captured the attention of fans around the country. Coming up, a look at some vintage Mikan as we take you back to 1953 in the Airwave Archive. The year was 1953. George Mikan and the Minneapolis Lakers won their fifth NBA championship. And to mark the occasion, the Lakers came out with a year-ending highlight film, which has somehow, after all these years, found its way into our Airwave Archive. So let's take a trip out to Minnesota to meet the champs. And if you've ever wondered how the team came to be called the Lakers, well, you're in luck. This film will certainly answer that question for you. And where do you look to find the world's greatest basketball team? Well, look for the land of 10,000 lakes. Actually, there are a lot more than 10,000 lakes in this state, but it's easier to say 10,000 than 12,462. And the capital city of basketball is a city of lakes, with nearly a dozen beautiful ones right in the community itself. Lakes in which you can swim and play. Lakes in which you can even hold a world-famous water festival, like the Aquatennial, where day and night, millions enjoy observing a week-long aquatic Mardi Gras. is in Minneapolis, city of lakes, in the land of the sky blue waters, and naturally enough, the home of the Minneapolis Lakers, the world's number one basketball team. Five times world champions in the last six years, five titles out of six in the league that contains the world's best players, the champion of champions, the greatest basketball team of the century, the Minneapolis Lakers, and now, Meet the champs. Hello, I'm Dr. Finn Larson, Director of Research at Minneapolis Honeywell. We at Honeywell are proud to bring you the story of the Minneapolis Lakers, the great champions who have done so much to carry the name Minneapolis across the nation. But I know you're anxious to meet the champs, so now I'm going to turn you over to the man who knows so much about the Lakers, he's often called the voice of the Lakers, Dick Enroth. Hi there, everybody. Last spring, the Minneapolis Lakers won their fifth World's Championship in six years of league play. How well I remember that big night in New York City when they beat the powerful Knickerbockers to do it. The Lakers were hot from the opening cap-off. They've got the ball, and Jim Pollard's one-hander is a bullseye. Carl Brown of New York driving in for a scoop shot. No good. The rebound's taken by Pollard, and here come the Lakers. Over to Martin at the side. Slater's up with a set shot. Perfect. Ernie Vanderway of the Knicks with the ball. Over to Sweetwater Clifton is having trouble trying to crash the Laker defense. Back out to Vince Brilla who sets. Boom. Standing room only here in Manhattan as the Lakers keep up the pressure. Bobby Harrison with a one-hander. He is terrific. Minneapolis leading at the quarter 19 to 18. An overhand set by Connie Simmons. It's in there. The visitors from Minneapolis with a chance to sense the world's championship tonight are going with all burners. They're passing and shooting sharp. Bob Harrison's one-hander does it. New York's ball. Dick McGuire starting to drive. Simmons' hook shot is blocked, but Simmons steals it right back again and scores. 
Now the flashy backcourt men from Minneapolis. This was the brand of hard-fought basketball we saw in New York the night that the Lakers went on to take it all 91 to 84 for their fifth world's title. Yes, that was a great night for the Minneapolis Lakers. They accomplished the almost impossible. They beat the red-hot New York Knickerbockers three straight games, and they did it on the Knicks' home floor. But a lot more goes into a world's championship than just individual talent. Work, for example, in planning and practice. Practice and then more practice. To build a great team, a championship team, you need the immense height and strength of men like Mikan. This doubles the effectiveness of every shot by maintaining control of the ball. If you miss the first, maybe, maybe you'll make the second. And if your opponent misses the first, he doesn't get a second chance. You need men like Pep Saul and Bobby Harrison who can drop those long ones through the hoop when the defense has you stymied on the inside. Watch this one. You need men who can stay in there when the going is tough. Men who can break through and score when you need the points. Men like Jim Pollard. You need a man with the grace and skill of a ballet dancer and the fingertip control of a juggler. That's Vern Mickelson. And it doesn't hurt to have a little fellow around like Slater Martin. A fellow who can cool off the hottest of shooters with a fierce defense. Watch him in action here. Well, if you're world champions and you want to stay world champions, you start with an idea. You know that Big George is the greatest basketball player of the century, was elected to that honor in Associated Press poll, as a matter of fact, and you know that other teams know it. They figure if they can get George down to 10 or even 15 points a game instead of 35 or 50, they've got you beat. And they know how to do it. They've got to sag in on George and cover him like a blanket. Watch how they cover him now. Again, they're all over him. Say you're a coach like ex-Minnesota star Johnny Kundla, the man who's guided the Lakers to those five world championships. If you're in John's shoes, what do you do? Well, you lock yourself up in the gym. You get an idea and then you start perfecting it. Then you practice and practice and keep practicing. So let them smother George. Let them hold him down to 10 or 12 points a game. So you use George as a decoy. Well, you get off to a good start, but the rest of the coaches have been around too. Men like Joe Lapchak of the Knicks, who used to play with the Lakers of an earlier era, the famed New York Celtics. And Red Auerbach of Boston, who's written a book on how to play basketball. You know that you've got a big team with power, a team that can rise up out of those battles under the boards to get those all-important rebounds. But you know what the league is going to do next. They're going to send their speed merchants out against you and try to run you to death. As long as they can't outpower you, they're going to fast break you. Fire that ball down the floor and make your big boys wear themselves out, running up and down that floor. That fast breaking can break your heart too. But when they lay those easy ones in there, you start to wonder how good you really are. The league tried everything to slow down the Lakers, but they just had no answer for George Mikan. In fact, the Lakers won every title over a seven-year stretch, except for 1951. And that year, George was sidelined late in the season by a broken ankle. We'll return to our Lakers film in a moment. And while we're on the subject of films, here's this week's trivia question.
George Mikan may have been the leader of the Lakers, but he wasn't their only star. The team had three other Hall of Famers, Vern Mickelson, the game's first true power forward, Jim Pollard, the original kangaroo kid, and point guard Slater Doogie Martin, not to mention Bud Grant, who later became a football Hall of Famer as head coach of the Vikings. Let's get back to our film now as the Lakers try to figure out how to stay on top of the league. So what do you do? You get back in the gym again and start practicing, practicing the fundamentals just as if you were back in high school. Fingertip control, get the rebound, move that ball, throw those passes, and run, run, run. You see, you've got some speed merchants too. If a team like the Lakers that's known for power can fast break, well, it won't be your heart that's broken. And your idea pays off. You bump into a fast breaking team. And you fast break right back at them. Of course, the fast breaking only works for a while. The league catches up to you again. Then they start to play control ball against you, making you come out and get it, holding the ball and forcing you to make the mistakes while they wait, wait for the sure shots. So it's back to school again. How are you? Okay, how you How's doing? your ankle? Real good. Morning, gentlemen. Oh, Judge. Hello, Hi, Bob. Hello, Hello, George. Hello, George. Hello, Where's Jimbo? How you doing? Uh, George, hey, tell me a story about Sadowski on the fast break real quick, George, while I got a little time. <laughs> well, man, you know, we don't like to talk about it. <laughs> How many times did he score on you? He just got three set shots, didn't he? Listen, he never shot from that far out before. You think he was an old pro with the college spirit? That's what he told me. He got a pretty good fast break, didn't he? Listen, why didn't you watch him when he turned his head out there? It was funny. That was funny. You watch him and let George watch Davies sometimes. That's right. Take him in the pivot. Well, I'm a fast man. Let's face it. Well, you got to say, old black. I can't say it. I can't say it. All right, let's let's settle down, fellas. Settle down. Let's get serious. Check check the coach. I think we won 20 in a row here. All right. First of all, I want to make an announcement. We're going to practice at the athletic club right after this pitcher. Uh, now I want to go over the mistakes we've been making the past few games and uh, iron out some of these mistakes. So let's pay attention closely and, and go to work. You all set? Ready. Here are our pitchers from our last New York game. Let's uh, study them closely, and if there's any mistakes, let's run the pitcher back. Well, let's get that rebound there. There they go, running again. Back on that defense. Well, Vince goes through there and passes off nicely on that one. And we can't get that ball again. How many times are they grabbing it? Come on, get that rebound. Here we're all watching the ball here, and we're missing our men. Two guys are watching oh, the ball here. They let that man get away. That's, That's what fault. happens. Was that your fault, Jim? <laughs> oh, there they go. It was that fast break again. There's a mistake there. Let's let's run this back here and look this over again. Make uh, especially well, watch uh, yourself running down the court there. You're looking for your man, and it looks like Hitch has got him covered. All right, we'll check it now. The secret is to uh, help each other out in a fast break out there. We'll have to talk a little more. When the movies are over, it's back to the gym. Even though by the middle of the season you feel as if you've had enough basketball to last you a lifetime, but that's the price you pay for being a champion. If they've been plugging up against Mikan, Pollard, Mickelson, Martin, and the others are your extra punches. So you work away at perfecting plays built around them. You practice whenever and wherever you get the chance. You try out the California play built around Pollard. It is, in effect, a double block for Jim's favorite one-hander. In this play, the two guards, Martin and Harrison, set up the block with an assist from Mikan. You rehearse it again and again. The arrow points to Harrison, who's blocking Pollard's man, springing kangaroo Jim clear to make his patented shot. Then they use it in a game just like this.
worked hard perfecting the Texas play, a running crisscross built around your fastest man, Doogie Martin, the classy little Texan. You do it over and over again to get it right. Your forward's pulling out to open up the middle. The first cutter, Harrison, throws to Mikan, who gives it to the second cutter, Martin, who has a nice alley to the basket. And so you try it in a game. Harrison to Mikan, he's in the high pivot, and Slater Martin cutting in. The only thing that stops him is a foul. You put all these things together, you shift them every game to cross up the opposition, and you try to stay just a half a step ahead of the league. You travel east and west, and you drop a couple of tough ones on the road. You come home and win a couple, and you practice in between times. You plan some new plays and perfect some old ones. And meanwhile, you take them as they come. Sometimes you play five games and five nights and travel in between. But always you try to keep that half step ahead of the rest of the league. Planning, working, practicing, and playing. Once in a while, you get home for a rest. So nice to see George resting at home, but soon he'll have to head back to practice. And by the way, we've been keeping track. This film set the all-time highlight film record for use of the word practice. According to our crack staff here at Vintage NBA, it was mentioned at least 13 times, at least 13 times. But when it came to George Mikan, there was another word that usually came to mind, unstoppable. The giant could move with the speed of a lightweight. And when it came to scoring points, he was in a class by himself. He had some games where he had 54, 62. We had a pretty good ball club, and uh, he destroyed us. This chapter, Mr. Basketball, the story of George Mikan. Well, Mikan was like a Michael Jordan, a uh, Larry Bird, a, a uh, Magic Johnson. That's what he meant to the league. And long before Michael, Magic, and Larry, George Mikan was the first celebrity basketball player. He appeared on the popular person-to-person -person talk show with the legendary Edward R. Murrow. He also starred in commercials endorsing gum, beverages, even ironing boards. And of course, he's starring in Meet the Lakers, as we return to our announcer, a man who knows the importance of practice. As the season wears on, you manage to stay on top. Sometimes the margin gets pretty thin, but you plot and plan and practice and manage to pull out the close ones. I remember one in particular. The Lakers were at Fort Wayne. They're wearing the dark shirts in possession. And here's the situation. All through the game, Fort Wayne has been leading, at times by as many as 15 points. But now in the closing minutes, the Lakers have fought to their first lead, 67 to 66, a single point. Here's a pretty set shot by Edelman. It makes it 68-67, Fort Wayne. Martin down the court, over to Pollard. Harrison fires to Mikan. And when Big George hits at 69-68, the Lakers. Edelman is blocked by Saul. Back out to Shaws, who dribbles over to the side. He sets, and it's good. This one is close. Pollard takes it down the floor for the Lakers. He hands off to Martin. Doogie feeds Mikan, and it's good again. But here are the Pistons, very much in this ball game, with less than two minutes to go. Big Charlie Cher in the pivot position, fakes, turns, shoots, and hits. Minneapolis' ball, and they're playing heads up. Mickelson drops in a close one. It's good at close range. With Mikan breathing down his neck and the rest of the Lakers ready to sag in on him, Cher can't shoot from the pivot. But Shaw sets perfectly from the side. And the Lakers lead by a single point, 79 to 78. But here comes insurance. Vern Mickelson is having a whale of a night. Faust is battled up in the key. Watch the steal now, coming up by Bobby Harrison. He's got it. And with Mike and Ann Mickelson collaborating, the Lakers have another basket. Minneapolis leading 83 to 81. That's Edelman setting. It rims the basket, and the Lakers have the rebound. Harrison holds it up, 
getting set for a play. There's Mikan. His quick set is off the rim, but George makes good in his second try, 85 to 81. Frankie Bryan is shackled by Martin, and the Lakers take over again. Two quick passes, and Mickelson has a hanger, 87 to 81. Interception by Pollard. And the Lakers have the game on the ice, 59 points for Minneapolis in the roaring second half, 36 of them in the final quarter. Martin drives in for the last score, and the Lakers win it, 89 to 81. Yes, Laker fans get plenty of excitement game after game as the season goes by. Close ones, like the one you've just seen with Fort Wayne, keep you from getting complacent. But finally, you make it. You wind up on top with the Western Division title. And there's only one thing that stands between you and your fifth world's crown, a championship team from New York. East meets West in a seven-game playoff series. Your only hurdle now, the New York Knickerbockers, champions of the East. That means more study, far more carefully than ever before. You must assess the techniques, the strengths, and the weaknesses of the team against you. That's Slater Martin watching one of the stars, Carl Braun, number four. Long a tough adversary for the Lakers, a part of New York's strategies to play him as a guard, pitting him against the shorter Slater Martin. While George Mikan looks on, he sees Sweetwater Clifton, number eight, former mainstay of the Harlem Globetrotters, the man with the biggest hands in basketball. He and Ernie Vanderway are two of New Yorker's best men who can bust up a game any moment. Bobby Harrison looks over Dick McGuire. There he is, tricky Dick McGuire, playmaker of the Knicks quintet, extremely fast and clever, and a very good shot. And so the big night arrives, the night of the opening playoff game in Minneapolis. And you plan. And you run. And you lose. All your planning, all your preparation, your strategy, your confidence is counted for nothing. But you're the champion. You buckle down, the next night tells a different story. Then the series moves to New York and keeps going. You win another. You go on to take your third straight. Finally, the memorable night in Manhattan and that crucial game when the fans wondered, can the Lakers add one more game to clinch their world's title to be world champions? And here we are in that climatic contest, the New York Knicks wearing the white shirts. That's Ernie Vanderway getting a tap in. Lakers ball. Martin has it. Over to Pollard. Look at him go. Clifton of New York drives down the middle, but his underhand shot is missed. Pollard recovers for the Lakers. Doogie Martin passes back to Saul, and he pops in a beautiful jumper. Knicks ball. They trail in the final quarter, 69 to 60. McGuire's tricky pass is snared by Martin, and it's a steal and a counter steal. Howard finally fires it to Mickelson, who's got a lead pipe cinch. Vanderway gets a screen, and he gets a basket. The Knicks are fighting back. Mikan is being guarded like gold. Martin can't feed him. Out to Pollard. Back to Doogie. Watch this set. It's beautiful. Vanderway over to Gallatin. Out to Barilla. Vanderway feeds Simmons. It's a nice one. Two minutes to go in an all-court press by New York. It's hands off to Pollard, and it's good. The Knicks are battling desperately and effectively. They trail by only five points, 85 to 80. Vanderway into Simmons. And pandemonium breaks loose as he gets his hook shot in. A steal by Vanderway, who races down the court to make it 85 to 84. Jump ball, and Mike can go straight to his target. With less than 30 seconds left, that nails it down, the Lakers go on to win. Their fifth world's championship, and a more jubilant team of athletes you never saw. Congratulations from the losers, who put up a terrific fight before they went down. 
The celebrating goes right on into the locker room, where a lot of tired but happy Lakers continue to rejoice. This is a night they'll never forget. So the Lakers do it again, but they weren't through yet. Minneapolis came back in 1954 and won another title, becoming the first NBA team to pull off a three-peat. Following that season, George Mikan retired to become the team's general manager. And after a brief comeback in 1956, he finally called it quits for good. Mikan had been the Superman of the NBA, but with his glasses, he also bore a, a striking resemblance to Clark Kent. And we'll look at some of the trends in NBA eyewear. Personally, I cannot wait for this when we come back. George Mikan's career got off to a slow start as he was cut from his freshman team in high school. At the time, the coach told him, you just can't play basketball with glasses on. You'd better turn in your uniform. Well, George would wear a uniform again, and he never stopped wearing his glasses. A pioneer in many ways, Mikan was also the trendsetter in basketball eyewear. But there have been some other visionaries <laughs> who followed him. Remember Gerald Govan? Uh, we didn't either until we found his old basketball card and discovered he too wore glasses and he wore them throughout his entire nine-year career in the ABA. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's patented shot was a skyhook, but his trademark in fashion was his goggles. Kareem decided to wear them later in his career after being poked in the eye one too many times and soon others began to follow his lead. One of them, Kareem's teammate on the Showtime Lakers, James Worthy. Worthy donned his own set of goggles for his flights around the rim. And after James retired, his uniform and his goggles were both sent to the Smithsonian Institute. Those Laker teams also had a throwback to George Mikan and Clark Kent and Kurt Rambis. You knew that one was coming. But it was anything but mild-mannered with his physical style of play. And his retro black frame glasses helped make him a cult hero in L.A. with a fan club that adopted his look called the Rambis Youth. <laughs> but for most players, the goggles are the preferred form of eyewear. The Houston Rockets' Akeem Olajuwon has worn them at times. After all, you, you need good vision to be able to make those long-range fadeaway jump shots like Akeem. And Horace Grant has taken it to another level by color coordinating his goggles. When he was with the Bulls, Horace had white ones for home games and then a set of red ones to match Chicago's road uniforms. After being traded to Orlando, he of course put on a, a set of blue goggles and then after joining Seattle, Horace had a pair made up in forest green to match the Sonics uniforms. By the way, Horace had laser surgery and doesn't need prescription goggles anymore. He says he keeps wearing them because kids tell him it looks cool. Well, we went around the league to get some more insight on this subject. Not really sure who wears eyewear. Wow. I don't know, now they all have the goggle look. I don't think anybody wears glasses, do they? They have those protective almost like motorcycle goggles on. Elliot Perry might be the only guy I know of that wears them now. Well, you know, Horace Grant been wearing them for so long, you know, it's kind of like he was born with them. You know, you've been seeing them around the league so long, you know, wearing them. You know, it's kind of, if you see them without them, you're like, where's the glass? I'd say probably Bo Outlaw. I've actually seen Bo Outlaw shoot his free throw. He kind of shoots it kind of awkward, and it's actually scraped. <laughs> the top of his goggles before, knock him off during a free throw. Which is kind of, you know, different. And then he starts wearing them here and then they fog up. It's quite, quite comical, actually, the whole thing. It really is, and hopefully by next season, Bo will be able to work out his problems. In the meantime, you can drop us an email if you'd like to talk about NBA eyewear or the career of George Mikan or anything else you'd like to talk about. We're at NBA.com in the TV program section. Check us out. We'll be right back. April, a life-size sculpture of George Mikan was dedicated outside the Target Center in Minnesota. It depicts George hitting his trademark hook shot. 
A small replica of the statue were given to Kevin Garnett and Shaquille O'Neal. Now, since George's heyday, other players have scored more points and received more attention. We know that. But no one had more of an impact on the game. And when the history of the NBA is written, there is no better place to start than with George Mikan. That's it for Vintage NBA. Glad you could be with us, everyone. I'm Robin Roberts. We'll look for you again next time. Till then, take care. Hall of Fame coach John Cutler. Hall of Fame forward Kyle Lavelle. Hall of Fame guard Slater Martin. Bye.